Our scripture passage this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter, in which we hear the parable of the sower. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arise on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke out the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Here ends our scripture passage for this morning. May it be a blessing to those who hear it and to those who keep it. Amen. Please join with me in a word of prayer. Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, last week I recounted in brief my time spent on sabbatical, breaking the events down into weeks of where I was, why I was there, and what I was able to do. For some, it may have sounded like I had a very nice time doing not very much at all, and to a certain degree, you'd be right. But while I was on sabbatical, I was also able to read and complete a book and a workbook on this book, Weird Church, Welcome to the 21st Century by Beth Ann Eastock and Paul Nixon. As I made my request for sabbatical, a time that I knew that a part of that would be to spend some of that time reading, as this is often the best way to learn something new and to better oneself. In January of this year, this particular book was highlighted by the United Church of Christ newsletter, and so I thought that it would be a good one. Happily, in spite of everything else going differently on my sabbatical, I was at least right about the book. So much so that I would like to conduct a book study using this particular book with a few of our members as inspiration and direction for the future of our church here at Emmanuel. Unlike previous years where I spent the entire summer working through a book within my sermons, I do not plan to do that with this book, but instead will share a few elements about the book. Overall, it is broken down into two parts. <clears throat> The first part discusses all of the issues and the problems the church in America currently faces, providing a history of the church in America and describing in detail how it came to take its current shape and form, i.e. worshiping on a Sunday morning, having a preacher speaking like a news reporter before you each and every week, the recitation of hymns and prayers, and so on. As many of you are aware, this particular model of the church and worship has been and is being challenged, and potentially with good reason. Each generation has received and continues to receive the Word of God in many various forms. 
The shape the church has taken over the years has changed and will continue to change, no matter how much we may not want or desire for this to happen. One of the major points of the first half of the book, and what leads then to the second, is the idea of a wild church and or a wild ministry. What do I mean by this? Well, when Jesus first began speaking in crowds, as I covered last week, it was not in cathedrals with stained glass windows or castle-like structures representing the permanence and strength of God or even in cushy places with nice rows, cushions to sit on, plenty of seating for everybody, and nice, beautiful, glorious air conditioning. I don't know who made air conditioning, but I love that person. In fact, it was much like we are trying to do today, being wild, being outdoors. We are out of uniform. I'm out of uniform, not wearing my preaching robe. We're now connected to nature, and we're being a little in unconventional, but even by our standards, in sitting in family pods rather than in nice, neat little rows. Yet by the standards of Jesus' day, what we would see as wild and disorganized was simply the form which the church took in its time. Jesus was not the pioneer and perfecter of the open, fill, open field, hilltop, or even courtyard public speaking model. That was simply how people addressed large crowds in his day. Yet today, when we see something appear to us which seems to be wild and off the cuff, we call it inspired. And when the topic of the conversation is God, then we call it inspired by the Spirit. Or we call it crazy, depending on the message and who is offering it. Were I today go to go downtown right now to Twisted Whisk's corner in the square of the metropolis of Bluffton and begin preaching the word of God, some might be inspired to sit and to listen to me. Some might claim that what I am doing is led by the Spirit, while others would consider it to be a crazy person's rhetoric for the day. Who today preaches in the streets and not in the church building properly in America? Well, it's the radical, it's the insane, and it's the desperate. But not in Jesus' time. In Jesus' time, it would be entirely commonplace and perfectly acceptable, yet we would view it as being wild. On top of his perfectly normal format and venue of speech, Jesus was speaking of God to a people who were enamored by God. The Jewish faith and tradition, even to this day, calls for their people to be constantly aware and vigilant of every action and interaction that they have throughout each and every day, as their lives are ordered by God and their faith in such a way so as to permeate every minute and every decision that they make. Who to speak with, who to conduct business with, who to pray with, how to pray, what to pray, when to pray, who to eat with, what to eat, how to prepare those meals, and how to prepare yourself for those meals. Every single aspect of their lives is connected to God, taught to them over generations of tradition. And so for one man to speak openly in public about God, perfectly normal. But today, wild and out of hand. What was unique and radical, truly wild in the time of Jesus in his day was the message that Jesus had for the people. It was the message which eventually got Jesus killed, the message that stood in the face of the normal and the everyday. And to a degree, it was the very same message that seemed so wild at the time, so to as, be, as to be attractive to the people who heard it. So freeing, so as to draw crowds and to get people to think in different ways, and ultimately, to live different lives. We, the church today here in America, have become commonplace and normal. We are not wild by any means. We preach the word of God in the places that we are expected to preach. We talk about God and God's love, which is perfectly normal. And the message that we have sent out to the world has not changed in a millennia. If I were to boil down the first half of the book that I read into one statement, that statement would simply be, Church is boring, period. 
It is not exciting. It is not entirely engaging. And most importantly, it is not wild. So what do we do about that going into the 21st century? Well, we can't change the subject matter. God is still our focus, as well God should be. We also can't change the message all that much. Now, we do try to apply that message in our lives to the best of our ability, even when new challenges arise, which were never really addressed in Scripture. Nowhere in the Bible will you find, and then Jesus logged on to the Internet and said, for instance, but what we can change and what the book suggests is already changing, is the vehicle or the venue through which the message of God is being transmitted. The second half of the book covers the various ways these two particular authors and theologians, who are church seed planters themselves and successful at it, are seeing the church and its message thrive going forward. Small churches that are using their limited resources to spread their message over long distance using technology. Large churches who are well-financed and forward-thinking, creating what they call spiritual theme parks in their church, with interactive video walls in their hallways, with indoor slides leading to the children's classrooms in the basement, with small groups and large groups meeting into their, uh, and taking their place in their very own conference halls, which they are building right there on the campus non-church building, connected community gatherings, taking place over dinner at someone's large mansion-like home or small country villa, or in the community rec center downtown. Intentional communities of people choosing to live together on one property or joining together into community gardening. None of these formats are what we would call normal by the standards of today's church or yesterday's church, or as they put it into the book, church as we have known it. They are weird forms and formats for church, and ones that we might not even desire to call church. And yet, there's more energy, more spirituality, and ultimately the very same message and word of God being relayed within these churches. It's scary to think that the call to which I have been claimed to serve a local community church to preach on a Sunday morning may take on such a new and wild form in the future, and one that requires the pastor not just to be a theologian, but to be a community organizer or potentially a small business operator. Yet more and more in the field of ministry we are seeing become by and tri vocational pastors. And why not? Why not? Jesus. This wild preacher of a wild church, was he not also a carpenter by trade? Were not his disciples still fishing for fish while fishing for men? We should not be surprised that the format of the Christian message is changing. It has changed. It's evolved and adapted for millennia. We just happen to be in a time of such a radical shift. Today's scripture should be indicative of what that looks like. Jesus says in the parable of the sower that even in the good soil, the best soil, you will find some that will bear a hundred, some that will bear sixty, and some thirty. I don't need to tell a farming community about how some crops in fields do better than others, and that the reality is every single crop, every single year, no matter how good, no matter how bad, how big, how small, eventually will be harvested ended, and then something new can grow in its place. My friends, the church is no different than any of the fields that you see around us today. Do you know how many of those first churches which Paul established are still in existence today? None. Not one single church that Paul started in his time exists today. The father of the modern church could not even create something that lasted forever. But do you know who stands or what stands in their place? We do. We do. We are the results. We are one of the fruits which have been born from those very churches. We look nothing like them. We sound nothing like them. We do not gather in the same ways. We do not pray the same prayers. In fact, comparatively, we're like a banana that grew on an apple tree. 
That's not supposed to happen, right? That's weird. In our minds, that can't happen. But do you know who can make it happen? God, right? God can and did make that happen. So, what grows from our fruit? Who knows? I told you I attended St. John UCC's final service after 160 years of ministry, and again at St. John, John's in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, not downtown, right? After 160 years, a church that has, ha has a history not unlike our own historic past. First, they were German Reformed when they, eventually, when they were formed 160 years ago. Then they eventually became Evangelical and Reformed, just like we did. And then eventually they became the United Church of Christ, just like we did. Of that church plant 160 years ago, I am one of the fruits from that church. Cultivated there, born in Grace United Church of Christ, and nurtured for a time in St. Peter's Lishies United Church of Christ in York, Pennsylvania. Now I am here, an apple fruit living amongst the Buckeye trees. And I'm not alone in being this strange and transplanted crop. Each of you has a similar story of being planted, cultivated, and grown. Going forward, who knows where your life will lead, or where your own seeds will be planted, or what even will grow from those seeds once they've been sown. The point is, as Jesus talks about being good soil and receiving the word of God, those seeds which grow within us, what is being sown within us, is unique. Jesus takes all of the seeds and he mixes them together. And he goes out and he plants in the wild fields. And his message goes out to those on the road, in the underbrush, in the good, the bad, and the not-so-great soils. What grows there, then, is meant to be wild and beautiful. But in order for it to be wild and beautiful, we must be willing to be a little weird ourselves. My hope, as I said earlier, would be to read through this book again with a small group here in order to figure out what we might be able to glean from this, what we might be able to be going into this 21st century. And I say that because I truly believe that the soil here in Northwest Ohio is very rich, a little clay, I think, but very rich. And it's evidenced by the ministry that is being conducted here and that has been conducted here for many years which has been put into the time and energy that you have put into this church planting. My prayer would be this today. May we be a wild field and a little weird going forward as we grow together in Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> we respond to the word of God using our statement of faith, the Apostles' Creed. How comfortable are you? Do you need to stand? Do you want to stand? If you want to stand, you can stand. If you don't want to stand, don't feel weird. Be a little weird. Okay, then those who would like to rise, let us rise and state boldly what it is that we believe using the Apostles' Creed. That's mob theory happening right before you. Why did I stand? Because everybody else did. We say together, boldly saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And once again, let us listen to our hymn of response, I have decided to follow Jesus. What does this mean to you, and how are you living this out?
lyric in that song, as we repeat over and again, is, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Let us look forward together to the ministry that we have conducted and can conduct here in our church with our call to offering. Let us offer the fruit of our labor to God and make good on our vows to the Most High. At this time, we respond to the word of God with our gifts, tithes, and offerings. If you would like to use our Give Plus app on your phone or device, you may do so now. Or if you would like to, on your way out, please see the offering plate floating out there. Uh, that you may uh, visit that plate on your way out here uh, as you take your exit. And let us now take time to bless the gifts of our time, our talents, and our finances, praying together. You call us to sow your word in all times and places, even when the ground is hard and shallow. For faith is a gift that comes from you, and fruitful discipleship is the work of your Spirit in us. May the gifts we offer this day spread the good news of life abundant in Christ. Amen. And now I invite you to join with me in reciting the Emmanuel UCC Statement of Purpose. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, we at Emmanuel United Church of Christ are called to be a Christian family where spirituality means reflecting the joy of Christ in everything we say and do, being responsible and generous stewards of all that God has blessed us with, and reaching out to everyone with the unconditional love of God. And with those purposes in mind, we now say farewell and send with blessing our online community. May you know the love of God this week and going forward, my friends and brothers and sisters. Amen.